13. It's a section of text that we began covering a couple of weeks ago, and we're going to continue processing today. James 5, verse number 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. You may be seated. (coughs) Two weeks ago, we began our journey at looking into this text, being one of the most abused uh, scriptures or text in the Bible, our careful study of it. I believe, will liberate many of us who have baggage concerning the topic of physical healing and praying for people that need physical healing. Now, at its surface level, this text seems to present more questions than answers. And so we're going to look at those questions, and then as we process this text, we will look to answer these questions through sound biblical exposition. The first question I have to ask is, what kind of suffering is James talking about when it says, is anyone among you suffering? That's important for us to know. The second question is, it says, is anyone among you sick? Well, what type of sickness is James talking about? There's a lot of different types of sickness in the world. Sometimes people think, they they tell me I'm sick in the head. Is that the type of sickness that we're, we're talking about, or is this a different type of sickness? It says, let them call on the elders of the church to pray over them. Are the prayers of elders different than the prayers of non-elders? And so that's a question that we need to spend some time answering. Anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. What is this anointing with oil that is described? Why would we do that? Why are we being commanded to do that? It says, the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. Well, why does the sick person need saving? Doesn't he just need healed? Why would he need saving? Also, what does sickness have to do? How does it relate to our sin? Because that brings it up as a part of the conversation. We also see that therefore you confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you, are, that you may be healed. So what type of healing is this talking about? Are we talking about sin? Are we talking about physical issues? What are we talking about? What, what is being healed here? And then at the end, this mention of Elijah, why does James use an illustration about rain in the middle of talking about prayer and healing? What does that have to do with the whole picture? So two weeks ago, uh, when we uh, first uh, approached this text, we answered the question, what type of suffering is James talking about here in verse number 13? The type of suffering, if you go back to the original language of the New Testament, which is Koine Greek, is kakapatheo. Kakapatheo is suffering as a result of evil treatment at the hands of other people. And so what we discovered in in doing this analysis and going back and looking at the original intended audience for the book of James would have been the dispersed Jews. A lot of them were under persecution because of being Jewish and being Christian. A lot of them were in hard labor camps because they were separated from their homeland of Israel. A lot of them had very harsh conditions. They weren't able to make money for themselves, all sorts of issues. This was the type of suffering that these individuals are being addressed to. Now that we know what type of suffering and what Je- who James is talking to, let's discuss the solution What are they to do? And in verse 14, it says, Is anyone among you sick? (laughs) What type of sickness is James talking about? Well, the Greek word here for sick is astheneo. And in the Bible, it's used multiple times. In some places, it's translated to the English language as the word sick. and other places, it's translated to the word weak. In fact, it's translated six, nine times in the New Testament. I know this is really small text and very difficult to read, but if you were able to see it up here, 
you would see that almost every occasion except for one happens in the Gospels or in the book of Acts. So these are historical narratives that are telling about something that happened. So nine times in the New Testament, this word astaneo is translated six, except for James. James is anomaly. It's translated to the word weak 12 times in the New Testament. Interestingly enough, the only anomaly is it's one time in the book of Acts. The rest of these occurrences are in one of what's called the epistles. The epistles are the letters that the apostles wrote to the churches on how to operate in the church. So what you have is in the Gospels and in Acts, you have sick, except for James. And then what you have with weak is you have it in all of the epistles, which James fits into that bucket. It is an epistle. You have it translated weak, except for one occurrence in the book of Acts. We also see it most notably uh, translated here in 2 Corinthians 12.10 by Paul. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am astaneo, weak, then I am strong. This seems to fit the context of what James is talking about, right? For when I am weak, insult, hardship, persecution, and calamities. Romans 14, 1, as for the one who is astaneo, weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. In 2 Corinthians 13, 9, for we are glad when we are astaneo, weak, and you are strong, your restoration is what we pray for. There's a real spiritual connotation to astaneo. <clears throat> so I have questions on why astaneo was translated to sick so heavily in the Gospels and Acts, all of which are historical narratives. Then astaneo was translated heavily in the epistles, the letters to the church, as weak, but James, sticking out like a sore thumb, all of a sudden uses sick again. My frustration with this, or I, I shouldn't maybe say frustration, but sort of the inner turmoil that I have in my study is nothing in James is about physical illness. We have been in this book since the second week of January 20 to the 23. We have looked at every scripture. Sometimes we have taken several weeks just to look at one verse. We have dissected this book down to every minute word and piece that we possibly can. Not a single thing is about physical ailments or illnesses. So why sick? We've been through the whole book at this point. We're almost done. We literally, I think, have two verses after this section of text. Never brought up. But... Suffering believers and encouraging them to stay strong and enduring until the end is all over the place. So why would a word that has been translated by everything around it to be weak all of a sudden is translated sick when only sick is used in the gospel and acts to refer to the physically ill? But James doesn't even talk about physical illness anywhere. It's completely outside of the realm of what he's talking about. Well, my initial reaction when I was studying was, you ever, you ever get in that place? School started this week, so I think everybody could resonate. Well, you just get frustrated with trying to figure something out. And you're like, this just doesn't make sense. And my initial reaction was, did our translators fail us? Well, no, most of them did sick. They're a lot smarter than I am. So I would consider the reality that some of those that were spiritually weak Part of the reason why they were spiritually weak was because there was some physical component that was involved in their spiritual weakness. I started to consider, is it possible that they were sick because of their weakness or weak from their sickness? All the result from being mistreated from others because of their faith. It is true that many of the people that James is talking about would have been malnourished, flogged, as a part of their slavery and hard labor camps. And many were under such great mental anguish and distress that it tormented them. Any of you that have ever dealt with uh, uh, panic attacks or anxiety know that though it's in, it's in your brain and your brain chemistry, it very much manifests itself in your body. 
And so I'm looking at saying there's, it's very likely that many of these individuals from malnourishment, from being flogged, from being beat, literally beat up for the gospel, a lot of these guys, part of their suffering, it's not the whole picture. And it's not exclusive to physical. But, but James makes that clear throughout his entire book. He's talking about spiritual healing. He's talking about how important this is. We see that in Cacabatheo. We see that the suffering is because of persecution from the gospel. It's not because someone coughed on them and they're sick. And so it's likely that a lot of them had some sort of physical thing that went along with it. So we must consider that the person that is presenting themselves as weak or sick could be both, weak and sick. The key here is that they weren't well and that they needed help. And the reason they were not well is cacopatheo, which is evil treatment at the hands of others. They were suffering because other people were treating them poorly because of their faith in Jesus. In light of our understanding of the Greek and in the context of this entire book, the most healthy interpretation would be that these people that are being called in this case are people that have become weak or sick by suffering and have become defeated in their spiritual battle. They have lost the ability to endure on their own, something that James has addressed over and over and over again in this letter. Don't give up, don't give up, don't give up. Stay strong. These are fallen spiritual warriors, exhausted Weary, depressed, defeated Christians, they have tried to draw on God's power through prayer, but they have lost motivation. Have you ever been so down and out that you didn't even have enough strength to mutter a simple prayer? As scripture talks about this, there's one occasion where Paul is talking about uh, uh, groanings and moanings that come from people that only the Spirit understands. There's this idea that sometimes a person is in such heartache and turmoil and is so spiritually distraught and empty that they can't even formulate words to pray to God. And, and, and I think there's times, if we would all be honest with ourselves, there are times when even the idea of going to God in prayer puts a bitter taste in our mouth because if we'd be honest, we're blaming him for some of the things that are happening to us. Why would I want to go to the person that I'm placing blame and responsibility on for my condition when it has nothing to do with him? Maybe that's just me. But these people, they've lost their ability to draw on God's power through prayer. And and I think in a lot of these cases, as we can see well addressed throughout the book of James and, and on through our text here, is that a lot of these people have turned to sinful attitudes and patterns of sin. In order to self-soothe, in order to process their emotions, they're turning to their flesh in order to appease themselves rather than turning to God. And what this text is saying is that when someone is down like this, the spiritually weak need the help of the spiritually strong. 1 Thessalonians 5.14, we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the astaneo, be patient with them all. So this whole book encourages people to hang in there, endure, stay strong. But if you can't, go to those that currently can, the elders, and they will take you to the source of strength. Some people say, I I can do this Christianity thing without the church. And when I say the church, I'm not talking about an organized meeting. What I'm talking about is brothers and sisters in Christ globally. I can do this thing without fellowship in the church. I can do this thing in isolation. Uh, I, I think that that is a gross misunderstanding of the design of how God made us and a gross misunderstanding of how God made the bride of Christ to be a collective, unified body around his word that we each need each other. And, and to say that I don't need other people to walk this out is, is first of all, being disobedient. It's also, second of all, being prideful. And, and the third thing is, I get it. It comes sometimes from a place of hurt. I, I opened my heart up to somebody before, and they misused it. They gossiped about the information, and it hurt me. I get it. We've all been there. We've all done that. But you can't use that as a way to keep you from receiving what you need from the body the second time. And listen, it may happen again, but isn't that a part of life? We put ourselves out there, you get hurt sometimes. 
And so what happens is, is also we have to understand that a person that isolates themselves away from the body, they are, in essence, they're a, a, a wounded sheep that is bleeding that is now isolated from their protection, isolated from their shepherd, isolated from the other sheep, and they are easy pickings for the enemy. And so when you're out bleeding and you're wounded, you are easy bait for the enemy to come and, 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 and take you out. So there is a benefit, and I'm not just talking about religious gatherings. I understand that some people don't want to do that. They want to do maybe home gatherings, or they want to have fellowship with people they know. I have no problem with that. But what I'm saying is that for a person that wants to isolate themselves completely from Christian fellowship in the body and praying for each other, they put themselves in a really, really dangerous position. So the, si- the next question that I would have to, to, to ask is, let them call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him. Are the prayers of the elders different than prayers of non-elders. Elders in the Greek is presbyterios. It is the same word that we find for bishop and pastor. Um, It is the pastors of a church. Uh, Weak believers, perhaps even sick from their battles, as we all know that the condition of our emotions and mind affect our bodies, are to go to those appointed and called by God in the church to oversee and lead. Elders are there to be a blessing to pray for those who need to be lifted up. They are pastors. They are shepherds. They serve the church by sharing their strength through prayer with those that are simply too weak to pray for themselves. The wounded sheep go to their shepherds to be restored, to be encouraged, to be edified. Now, here's the key, and a lot of people get this a little skewed, both on the shepherd side and on the sheep side, People think that the shepherds have the ability to restore it. No, we don't. But what we do is is we can take the sheep to the source of the strength. So it's not, here, let me pray for you, and then there's an inherent power because because there's reverend in front of my name. That's not the key. The key is, is, listen, because I'm of clear mind right now and you're not, I'm going to take you to the source of my strength that I'm drawing off of so that you may draw from that strength as well. I'm just the under-shepherd taking you to the shepherd. Like, I'm just taking you to the one that can restore you, and I am here to, to help you along the way. That's what an under-shepherd does. We don't have power to restore, but we take you to the one that does. Okay? So, listen, counseling, therapy, all great. Highly encourage that. I think everybody needs some maintenance every now and again. But let those be a supplement to what God commands weak believers to do. Seek prayer from elders. We do that in our services during worship time. At the end of the first song, normally, we come up, we have elders and elders' wives because that that way there's appropriate interactions with male and female. And we invite people to come up and receive prayer. Some take advantage, others don't. Here's what I would say. If you walk in weak, and unable to draw on strength from the Spirit of God yourself. You are being disobedient to refuse to draw from the spiritually mature, to draw from their strength. That doesn't, there's not categories here. Please understand. Elders are here to serve. It's not that there's this tier thing. There, of course, has to be oversight and leadership and all of that. That's how God cares for his body, and that's how he establishes leadership. But there's no specialness or power. There's no ranking systems. There's no tiers. At the end of the day, elders are to serve by taking people to the Lord who can restore. So as your faith and your strength will lead you to the source of their faith and the strength which is the Lord in prayer. So the the key here is we have to understand that if we come in and we're in a place to where maybe we are so wounded as a sheep in the field that we have tried to crawl to the lake to get some water, to get some refreshing, and we haven't been able to make it there, we've lost motivation, we are tapped out, we are done, I can't take this anymore, then what you do is you say, elder, under shepherd, whoever's discipling you, and then we come and we grab you and we drag you, sometimes kicking and screaming, to the water and say, drink. And we stay there and make sure that you drink. That's what's happening in the spirit realm, so to speak. Not to make that a weird thing. But that's sort of a physical picture of what's happening when we do this thing called prayer. Now, I would encourage you not to take the word weak as an offense. 
That's sometimes the problem we have when we receive prayer. Let me talk to you. Let me, let me split it up into genders for a second because we all process the word weak a little bit different. Men, being weak in the moment does not mean that you can't lift heavy things anymore. It doesn't mean that you can't grunt manly. It doesn't mean that you didn't mow your yard with ferocity and with a perfect pattern. It does not mean that you can't hit something hard. And it doesn't mean that you haven't done your due diligence as a male this week. Maybe it means that you are tired from the battle of raging war for your kids and for your wife and it has left you tired and unsure that you can keep going. Maybe it means that in your tiredness, you've slipped up and sinned. And we'll get to that in a little bit, how we talk about confessing our sins one another. And you just need to tell a brother, I messed up and I really need prayer and I need you to help restore me in that way. It could be that you spouted off at the mouth not that any of us would do that, or you simply don't have the energy to do devotionals or take your kids to church. Guys, we don't always show, show being weak normally. We have too much pride for that. But it's okay sometimes just to admit, I need prayer. And you know what? Sometimes being able to receive prayer, even in the context of in front of the body, it, sometimes that's a sign of strength because you're willing to admit that you're not God. And there's a lot of men walking around. You don't want to, you know, you say you're, you don't think you're God, but the way you live your life, you do think you're God. Because you think you've got to be everything to everyone. And sometimes you just got to say, I ain't got no more left in the tank. And that is the Republic way of saying that. <laughs> I ain't got no more left in the tank, and I, I just need a brother in Christ to pray for me. And, and, and you, you are setting a tone with your sons, you're setting a tone with your kids, you're setting a tone with other men in the church that look up to you by just simply saying, I need somebody to pray for me. And that is not a sign of weakness, it's a sign of strength. Because you know how to go to the, you know how to go to the source, or you at least know who to go to to take you to the source. I need someone that isn't empty to make me not empty again by taking me to God in prayer. That's wise. Women, <laughs> I know <coughs> admitting you're weak is also an admission that you can't be everything to everyone. By the way, at the end of the day, for most of you, no one actually expects that. That's an expectation that we normally place upon ourselves out of our own desire to be needed. Okay, so after a while, you get worn down and you just, you just need someone to lift you up. No other human being can lift you up the way that you need lifted up. And I'm sorry, like I, having friends and going to coffee with them is fantastic. I highly encourage that. Everybody needs that. But you need more than that. You need more than that. You need Christ. And so if you are escaping your time with the Lord and your time in the Word and your time praying and just going to the coffee date, you're missing out on the source. That's great. That friend may provide uh, uh, empathy and they may listen to your problems and they may give a helpful, encouraging word of advice. All of that we all need. But if you don't go to the source of strength, you're going to walk out with the same problems you had before. Admitting we're weak in the moment, and that we need help is strength. It's not weakness. You know, some of the most powerful moments that I've ever witnessed in church is when a friend will go get another friend in the, in the, in the room and take them down to the altar. Yeah. I've seen it happen, and it blows me away, and it's one, of the, like, it's one of the coolest things ever. Because here's what happens. We sat in our chair, and in, in whatever part of the service, for us, it would be the worship time at the end where the altars are open and the, and the elders are up here to pray. And sometimes, like the wounded sheep that doesn't even have enough motivation or strength to make themselves to the water, we sit in our chair and say, I don't even have enough strength to step out into the aisle and make my way down to the, the front where the, the opportunity to be prayed for is or where the altars are. But when you have a friend that knows that you need to go down and they walk up and they say, I'll go with you, let's go. Yeah. 
It gives you this empowerment and this encouragement because now you're not going down there by yourself. Now you're not, you're not thinking all the way down. People are just staring at the back of my head. Oh, great, this is probably going to get caught on the camera somewhere, which, by the way, we're working on that so that the, those times are more private. We're going to stop streaming that part of our service. But at the end of the day, like, everyone's worried that people are going to be staring at the back of my head. What's so-and-so going to think? I don't even have enough energy to step out into the aisle and walk down and receive prayer. The people will judge me. What if they do this? What if they do that? But if you have a friend that comes and says, come on, you need to go, let's go. That's powerful. You know, whether you're on the receiving end of that or you're on the, you're on the helping part of that, uh, it, it is as blessed to be the person that comes and says, let's go to the altar together, as it is to be the person that gets that invitation. Sometimes you've got to help people crawl out of the water themselves. Drag them in, sometimes kicking and screaming. Anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. What does this anointing with oil describe? There's a lot of controversy over this verse regarding anointing with oil. I've seen all sorts of things. I've seen people dump oil on people's head or take the little oil and put a little line on their forehead or make a cross. There's a lot of different ways that this has been worked out. So what does this mean? Here's what we have to do. We have to be careful not to take one verse and turn it into an entire theological system as some have done. There is, there is anointing with oil in the Bible and other places. We'll get to that in a second. But as far as a prescription to do it in prayer, there is one place here. One place. The rest of them are occasions that have happened. So why would James tell us to do that? Don't make a mountain out of a molehill. That is going to be my theme with dealing with anointing with oil. Here is what we know about the act of anointing with oil. There are four positions that people have taken as far as how it applies in the New Testament. We know that in the Old Testament, there was a specific recipe for the anointing oil. The anointing oil had cleansing properties, and it was applied to items, inanimate items, and to priests as a way to set them apart for work in the temple, in the tabernacle. The question is, what does James mean here? And how is anointing with oil executed in the New Testament? So here are the four, the four common understandings of what the process of anointing someone with oil actually means. One of them is heretical. Another one is situational and doesn't apply here. And the other two are possibly applicable. And we'll discuss why. So the first one that is heretical is that the act of anointing with oil is sacramental. What this means is that there are some that consider the action of anointing with oil to be a sacrament in the church, which means that it is a vehicle of divine power, that it, that it is, that is, an, is an action of worship in the church that Jesus has instituted and created, and that his real presence abides in that action, okay? <coughs> Some movements, most notably the Roman Catholic Church, have taken this act of anointing one with oil and turned it into a sacrament. In the 13th century, the Roman Catholic Church declared that the ceremony of anointing was to be one of the seven sacraments of the church. They would define a sacrament as a sign of grace instituted by Christ and entrusted to the church by which divine life is dispensed through it. Okay, so listen to this. In essence, the real presence of Christ abides in the ceremony. They call this sacrament extreme unction. In the Council of Trent in 1545, the Counter-Reformation, we call it, they declared an anathema or a condemnation on anyone that denies the sacrament of extreme unction. So you cannot be saved or a part of the Roman Catholic Church if you deny extreme unction. Extreme unction is where the priest would anoint those who were near to death with oil as a way to absolve any unforgiven sins and prepare the soul for dying. Okay? So in this case, it would be a vehicle for divine power. So this person is dying. They don't know Christ, sort of like infant baptism where we dunk them before they make a decision. This would be they never made a decision for Christ, so the oil has power to absolve their sins. So they might have a chance to go to purgatory, and then maybe we can pray them into heaven. Using it the way the Roman Catholics do, it is more pagan than Christian. Okay, so the, the, why I say that is, is the, the idea of using elements and objects and images to project, project a means of grace to affect someone's spiritual condition is a practice held by New Agers and those who practice divination. Crystals, rocks, uh, cloths, uh, uh, 
crystal balls, things like that. They, 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 they believe these objects contain and hold divine power and they become the vehicle for divine power to be instituted through them. So the idea that it would just be an oil is no different than that. The oil itself does not possess divine power and so they would say it does. So in that sense, it's less of a Christian practice, more of a pagan practice than that. So sacramental would be the one that we look at and say it's heretical. The next one would be ceremonial. Um, this was mainly an Old Testament practice such as some of the items in the tabernacle being anointed with oil. Kings were anointed to be set apart for service in their kingship. We see this in the New Testament a couple times, most notably in the case of Mary Magdalene. In Luke 7, 38, it says that she was standing behind him at his feet weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears and wipe them with her hair uh, and, and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. We also see it with Mary Magdalene again and Mary the mother of Jesus as they were going to in Mark chapter 16 verse 1 they were going to anoint uh, Jesus's body after he had died but when they got to the tomb he had been raised regardless when we look at James he is not referring to a ceremony of anointing there is no explicit instruction with anointing of oil as it pertains to the New Testament in a ceremonial faction so we can mark sacramental off as it's heretical we can mark ceremonial off because it doesn't apply the next one would be medicinal okay so in ancient times when medical technology was in its more primitive states there were very few effective medicines certain times certain times they may have used oil or certain types of oil were thought to have cleansing properties and to have soothing effects when they are applied maybe think of it as a modern bengay if anything, it was regarded to have a psychological effect on the person. It may have been possible that the elders literally rubbed oil on believers who suffered physical injuries from their persecution, who had sore muscles, bruises, and stiff muscles from hardened labor camps. It could have been an act of mercy and compassion on a wounded member of the body. Isaiah 1.6, we can see in the text where this was used for these cases. Uh, from the side, from the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is no soundness in it, but bruises and sores and raw wounds, they are not pressed out or bound up or softened with oil. So there's a softening medicinal purpose to the oil. We also see it in the treatment of the Good Samaritan, Luke chapter 10, verse 34. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. So there was a medicinal purpose in oil. And it's possible that when he was talking about the oil, he was talking about literal cases where they would come in and they would rub oil as sort of a, whether a medicinal or psychological effect that it would have for the people who are wounded. The last one is symbolical. Yes, symbolical is a word. <laughs> Others would hold to the fact that the, the, the use of oil was symbolic being that anointing with oil was used in the scripture for consecrating or setting someone apart for the special service or attention of the Lord, it could be a symbol of the reliance upon the Holy Spirit to restore a broken down believer. In other cases in scripture, you see oil as a reference or a symbol of the Holy Spirit. The ten virgins in Matthew 25. The, the amount of oil that was in their lamp was representative of them having the Holy Spirit or not. One commentator even suggested that there was an issue with pagan influence in that culture and that people, when they would begin to pray for other people, they would actually bring charms, incantations, stones, and incense and other pagan devices that they thought had mystical healing properties and the use of oil by the elders was to steer them away from bringing those items in. Here is the point. Oil is not sacramental. It's not just the Roman Catholic Church that has a problem with this making it a sacrament, by the way. The hyper-charismatic church, the use of oil in a lot of movements, they think the oil has power. They think that applying the oil has, has divine power to heal someone. That is taking it outside of its context and meaning. The oil has no power. That's more pagan than Christian. Okay, so we know it's not sacramental. There's no supernatural power in the oil itself. The process of praying for the weak is not ceremonial. So this is, being ceremonial is not wrong, but it just doesn't apply here. The oil could be used for medicinal purposes. It actually helped them physically. 
And it also could be symbolical in the sense that it was a way for the believer who was weak, and you have to understand these people, they're in bad conditions, maybe the oil would have represented to them the presence of the Holy Spirit touching them in the moment and, and, and restoring them. We don't quite know. It could be both. It could be one or the other. The point is, let's not make a mountain out of a molehill, 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 and make this into a bigger deal than what it really is, because we don't have any prescription anywhere else in text that tell us to do that. And so it could have been something for that particular audience. There's no way of knowing. Okay, so let's look at verse number 15. Why does the sick person need saving? Does the sick person need healed? Why would the sick person need saving? Now, if, you've, if you haven't bought to this point that what James is talking about is not physical healing exclusively, but spiritual. If you haven't bought that at this point, this will seal the deal right here. The word sick down here is different than the sick up here. Interesting. It's not astineo anymore. It's camno, which means weary, fatigued, and weakened. It's only used as sick one time here in James, and the same word is only used one time in the entire rest of the Bible. Hebrews 12, 3, consider him, talking about Jesus, who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Now, what's it talking about? Let's read some more context. Hebrews is telling you, say, look at Jesus in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Again, it wraps back around to the whole context of James, to the fallen spiritual warrior who may be in their fallenness, have given themselves over to sin, who have struggled, who have fought, who don't have enough energy to get up and even pray. Consider Jesus as your example as you grow chemno and are weary. Now, what does the word save here mean? The word save is sozo, and it means salvation or spiritual restoration. Why would a person that just has a physical element need to be saved? They don't. That's the key. Only the one that is spiritually weak needs completely restored or sozoed, and they need to be saved to endure until the end. Why? Matthew 24, 13, Jesus said himself, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And they're saying, this person who is giving up literally needs sozoed, restored, saved, so they can keep going and not give up. And it says the Lord will raise him up, which literally means to awaken a person that can't see, woken up. And then it goes on to talk about forgiveness of sin. These are sins committed during the time of spiritual drought. The whole text is about spiritual healing and the spiritual restoration of those that are enduring hardship at the hands of others. And yes, physical ailments may be a part of what has happened to them, but it's not exclusively physical. It's spiritual. Spiritual and physical may be one component of everything. They are weak. They cannot draw on strength themselves, so they need the spiritually strong to take them to a source of strength to be restored. So my question for you, is that you? Do you need spiritually restored? It's not wrong to get prayer for physical stuff. In fact, a lot of times we go through things where our physical body has been impacted, or our finances, or situations in our family, relationships, and those things are impacted, and that creates spiritual battles that does affect us spiritually. But my question to you is, do you need spiritually restored? Maybe some of you are sitting here, and you're, you're really lacking hope. You're confused, you're frustrated, just getting here this morning took everything inside you. You're lacking in love. That person that you felt like you used to be able to love, you can't, I, I have nothing left in the tank to love them anymore. 
You cannot maintain peace. There's chaos. And there's nowhere to go. Maybe you've even lost self-control. Maybe your mouth has spouted out. Maybe you've lost control over yourself and your decisions. You need God to restore you. And, and, and none of this, people in the church just sitting back and saying, well, you know, someone else needs pray for, I'm fine. We all need times where we are restored. All of us. Pride will keep us from some of the greatest and most richest spiritual blessings known to man. And so sometimes you just have to admit, I'm tired, I'm astheneo, I'm weak, and I need Jesus. And James says, when you're in that condition, go to the elders and have them pray for you. And the prayer made in faith will save Restore sozo the sick. The only question is will you be man enough or woman enough to admit you need it?